So Catherine Rowett is a former MEP for the Green Party. She was an MEP for the Eastern Region and is now the Green Party of England and Wales' spokesperson on work and social security. So we're going to be talking about uh, the minimum wage and the Green Party's position on that. Um, so the Green Party about 18 months, two years ago, passed policy that said it supported the introduction of a £15 an hour minimum wage. Why is that the Green Party's position? Uh, well, it's an interesting uh, history in a way because the Green Party um, uh, has been working towards getting uh, exactly that uh, policy for a while. So it was it started in autumn 2021 when we passed uh, a motion um, supporting the Baker's uh, Food and Allied Workers Union fight uh, for a £15 um, minimum wage. Uh, campaign and and somehow by passing support for that uh, we appeared to be already passing support for a fifteen pound minimum wage. But then it took another year before we actually got round to saying, well, yeah, we do support a fifteen pound minimum wage. Um, and of course, it's part of uh, uh, part of our policy that there should be more equality. Um, uh, among, uh, well, that people should benefit from the wealth that this country has and that we shouldn't be on uh, on low wages. Um, and uh, that, uh, you know, especially with the cost of living, it, it's, it's really important that people earn properly what they're worth. Um, and so £15 minimum wage, obviously, it's about £5 more than the current uh, minimum wage for um 23 year olds and above um and shockingly uh the, the country still has um minimum wage that goes below that uh for younger people so there's um age discrimination which we would be rid of um i don't know that's probably not explained why we have it uh, very well but i can go into more detail about what the advantages would be uh if you want please do yeah go ahead um so um, one of the problems at the moment is that a lot of people are supported on in-work benefits because it's actually not possible to live uh, and live well on the wages that are um, prescribed as the national living wage. It's not it's not a living wage. It doesn't it doesn't comply with uh, what's actually calculated to be the cost of a living wage. And even then, if you could calculate what's the cost of a living wage, uh, you might not actually be thinking about what it would be um, to live in such a way that you're not uh, deprived of opportunities and um, possibilities uh, and that families are not um, having to struggle. So one of the things that has happened at the moment is we've got people who are uh, in full time work, but they're also on universal credit. They're also having free school meals. Uh, they're also having um, rent uh, support. All of this is actually coming out of the public purse uh, and effectively it's subsidising employers to pay below what it actually costs to live and uh, to rent. Um, at the same time, of course, we're building up uh, educational disadvantage uh, for people who um, can't really afford to feed their children at home properly, can't afford heating, lighting and so on. Uh, we're also building up health inequalities and uh, so on. So there would be many um, benefits from having uh, a workforce that was actually properly rewarded uh, for what it does. But the expectation at the moment under a Tory government is always that the point of work is to feed money to the wealthy who um, are the the shareholders and, and uh, wanting the profit uh, and not to pay the workers. So we think that it should be the other way around. So one of the criticisms people uh, sort of level at substantial increases in the minimum wage is that uh, a policy that would raise the minimum wage to say £15 an hour would be inflationary and it would drive uh, inflation in the economy. Uh, what do you make of that, of that, that argument? Uh, well, it's certainly a mistake at the moment. What's driving inflation at the moment are uh, there are a number of things that are driving inflation. One of the most obvious ones, obviously, uh, is the cost of energy. 
um, and you can see in the profits that are going to Shell and BP and so on uh, that we are paying enormous amounts uh, out for our energy, that it's far more than energy actually costs. So that's one of the huge sources of inflation um, and the details of exactly uh, why uh, energy prices are so much higher than the cost of actually producing energy uh, is is uh, well, it's pretty complicated, but it's partly to do with Brexit and, and um, food prices, uh, very much to do with Brexit. Those, those have gone up 16 percent, um, uh, which is massive, right, because that's a really, really hard hit on those who's, uh, for whom food is a major part uh, of their um, their costs um, and um, I was just looking up um, the increases in rents um, so there's been um, a 13 percent rise in the in the cost of rents in Greater London uh, in the last year um, and a 7.4 percent increase in the east of England so, I mean obviously rents vary but rents are going up uh, all these things are going up um, because uh, <laughs> the costs that of the commodities, uh, the cost of the labour and so on um, for uh, some of these things are going up. Uh, so the the um, the rise in pay, if, it, if you have a rise in pay, which is what we need uh, across the board at the moment, really, um, and particularly in the public sector, uh, is following is uh, is what is lagging behind the inflation. So the inflation goes ahead. It's the cost of the commodities, um, the cost of the um, energy, uh, and so on. Then you need the wages to catch up. Uh, so it's not the wages that are causing the inflation. It's the um, uh, the commodity prices, uh, and um, so that's that's one reason why it won't be inflationary. Um, because, uh, in fact, uh, it's just a way of making sure that people are not having to have benefits uh, and go to food banks in order to make up the, the shortfall between their wages and what it actually costs um, to live. Uh, and while we're actually making up that shortfall from the public purse, uh, then the taxes have to go up and that's inflationary too. Um, uh, so, um, so in relation to inflation, I think uh, none of the wage rises that we've been talking about um, in relation to the kind of pay claims and, and strikes and so on, these are not uh, uh, these are not the source of inflation. And I think one of the problems at the moment is that the Bank of England doesn't really know what to do because it's not used to inflation that is not caused by an excessive money supply. Um, and so it's responding as if the inflation was uh, caused by money supply. Uh, and putting up interest rates, which is inflationary. Um, so in, interest rates go up, uh, that means mortgages go up, that means rents go up. Uh, so um, interest rate rises are, an, are a source of inflation. Um, if you then have a wage freeze, uh, you've got uh, a really dire situation of destitution and, and um, shortfall of, uh, of income towards what it costs to live. Uh, so, so the Bank of England doesn't know what to do, and the government doesn't appear to know what to do because it thinks that uh, you need to freeze wages, which is actually a nightmare situation and leads to more problems because if you freeze wages, uh, then um, nobody can spend any money. So this is another reason why there's a sort of virtuous circle if you pay the £15 minimum wage, um, because... Uh, one of the main problems for small businesses and so on uh, is a lack of um, resource uh, if they can't sell their product. If people can't afford to go to the pub, the pub will close. So you need people to be able to go afford to go to the local pub, otherwise the pub will close and then the pub will not employ the people who they would have been paying. So you need uh, people to have spending money. If you cut out all the spending money by um, freezing wages while prices go up, then everybody has to cut back and you can't afford to go to the pub. Pub will close uh, and then you don't get the um, tax income from the, the VAT and the, and the alcohol sales and so on. Uh, so um, tax revenues fall, um, 
uh, the, the, those people who are out of work, they will have, then have to be on, on benefits and so on. So, so the businesses will close, uh, the people will be out of work and you've got a worse situation. So it isn't as if um, leaving people with less spending money is helpful. Leaving people with less spending money actually causes worse problems. So on that that point around small business, uh, this is another area where there's, I guess, quite a bit of um, concern, at least, about a substantial increase to the minimum wage. And um, a lot of small businesses would, would turn around and say, looking at our books right now, we can't afford to pay anywhere near a £15 an hour minimum wage. Um, what do you make of that argument? And how would you uh, alleviate the concerns that people who run uh, independent small businesses, the kinds of things that the Green Party wants to see more of yeah, relative right. to the big chains. How do you alleviate those concerns? So um, uh, there are a couple of things to say there. One is that um, in the past, there have been the same worries when they introduced the minimum wage the first time uh, and whenever it goes up, uh, always um, some of the uh, small employers in particular uh, will say, uh, well, we couldn't afford this and our prices will go up if um, if we do this and, you know, there isn't room in the market for the prices to go up to the level that they would have to go up to and things like that. Um, so um, I think that uh, past experience shows that actually um, having more money flowing in the local economy turns out to be better for business, not worse. Um, it's true that in the past, um, in in the sort of Brexit, um, pre-Brexit period, there was more of a, uh, it was it was easier to uh, run a business. Uh, businesses were uh, more able to compete, um, but on a level playing field because there, there weren't the costs. So, for example, um, many of our small businesses that we particularly support as a Green Party are um, niche market uh quite um ecologically sound kind of production and that sort of thing and maybe they need a market bigger than their local uh um area and they would normally benefit from being able for example to sell uh goods uh across europe and um send them by courier and so on to where the demand was um, and you can see things like fisheries and so on that have been struggling since Brexit because uh, because of the um, barriers to trade. But I don't think that we should uh, infer that because there are barriers to trade and so the businesses are struggling because of Brexit, that therefore we should say, oh, well, we mustn't have an increase in the minim minimum wage because look, Brexit, right? Uh, you know, Brexit was supposed to deliver something that was better, not something that was worse. Uh, and um, so the last thing we want to do is, in the, is then say, okay, so to mend the problems that have been introduced by Brexit, you have to uh, destroy uh, the spending power and, and cut the wages of, of British people. Um, and so what what should you do? Well, how about supporting the small businesses? If there is a difficulty for the small businesses, then support the small businesses, right? Don't uh, support small businesses by penalising uh, the workers. Why should the workers have less than they can live on? And then we subsidise the workers from the public purse. Why not uh, make sure that there's a a good level playing field for the small businesses. So one of the main problems there is um, competing with, for example, uh, businesses like Amazon and so on that uh, don't pay proper tax, use our roads um, without uh, paying adequately for them, don't have high street stores and so on. Uh, whereas the people who have, have the small shops in our, in our high street are, um, struggling because they have to pay the taxes well you can you can shift the money around so that 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 in inequity is not there address the problem where the problem is uh not by um ma making the uh wages of the people who work there low and so um i've got some questions that have come in the chat um and they're on 
uh, well, they're on a range of different topics, actually, um, which I hope you don't mind that I put to you. Um, some of them within your brief and some of them, some of them not. Okay, uh, yes. So Steve C has asked, um, does Catherine think that a, a kind of more collaborative EU style of politics would aid in dealing with the cost of living crisis and other crises uh, in the UK? Oh, that's an interesting question. So um, uh, clearly, um, collaborative politics on the whole tends to be um, uh, less divisive and less likely to be maybe favouring one group of people over another. Um, I think we can see the benefits in Scotland where um, uh, the Green Party is in uh, collaborative government there um, and things are going much better uh, for them. But I wonder what the questioner has in mind that might be uh, beneficial that would um, lead to uh, improvements with regard to the cost of living. Any, any, just like, just I, I guess not wanting to put words into their mouth, but I guess the, mm. the trying to, I guess, um, get under the skin of the question. I think, like, you know, there's a, we have a very adversarial system which is based on. Uh, you know, not conceding ground to the opposition, not negotiating with the opposition. And so what you don't get is uh, opposition parties putting forward policy proposals that then are integrated into the political programme because they're not forced to through cooperative, collaborative decision making. And whether when you've got a crisis like the cost of living crisis or indeed the climate crisis or other issues, whether a more uh, collaborative consensus oriented um, mm. politics might deliver better results. Yes, um, up to a point, I think so. But um, uh, another part of me thinks that uh, we, we're we actually suffering from a lack of opposition at the moment um, in the UK uh, and a lack of leadership and willingness to stand up uh, and speak. Um, so um, both on the climate crisis and the cost of living crisis, there's, uh, there's almost too much consensus between the government and the opposition, and they are going the same way. They're not. Um, the opposition is not properly supporting the strikes, uh, and the unions um, is is quite reluctant to uh, stand with the workers. Uh, quite reluctant to say that we need to fund the NHS properly. Quite reluctant to say that um, uh, you know um, fossil fuels need to be ended or taxed properly and so on. Um, uh, so there's too much of the status quo and collaborative politics in my view. Uh, we need more leadership, uh, especially on, I mean, you know, beyond my brief, but um, uh, but on immigration, it's absolutely catastrophic. Uh, so, so I don't know that I think that we want anything in the way of collaboration between the main parties. Not if it um, means that. Not if it means that the um, uh, the opposition just say yeah, yeah, yeah to everything that Tories want. Thank you very much for uh, being willing to answer some questions that are slightly beyond uh, your portfolio and indeed for your insights on the £15 hour minimum wage. I'm going to have to let you go now because very, very soon I've got the next guest joining. Um, but uh, so I'll let you enjoy the rest of your Sunday. But I just wanted to say a massive thank you for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, thank you, Catherine.